All right, so we'll get started now. It's one o'clock on the dot, but we'll be recording this. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us here. We'll have, not only we'll have this recording available, but we're gonna make the slides available as well because there's a lot of content and detail that we put into the slides. All right, so let's move forward here. First, the, the risk disclosures, as all of you already know by now, but I wanna stress that as Tom is a representative of the Miami Exchange. So we just wanna be clear that nothing on here is investment advice and all of that kind of good stuff. So first about Tom, Tom and I are friends going back to the days when I used to be a broker and Tom was on the city bank desk, I believe at the time you're running the derivatives desk over there. Here's yeah. Tom, this little photo. He wanted to share this just to make sure we all knew exactly how old he was. Yeah, uh, exactly. Still there, still there, you know, a couple, couple strings less. Yeah. But you have an immense amount of experience, both as a, as a, a dealer on several bank desks. And then of course, now in your current role in representing the Miami exchange and specifically on the spikes a volatility product, which we're going to dig in today. And so I'm particularly excited to have you on because there's been this kind of wave of discussion about fixed strike vol and variants and VIX and, and, and at the money vols and, and the spike products really help us to kind of delve into that topic. And, uh, and you're so knowledgeable in the space. So I'm excited to, to talk about that. Thanks, brother. Uh, yeah. Oh, great. And as, as you know, Brad, I can talk very fast. So slow me down if you need to. I can too. Um, so we're going to spin ourselves into a tornado vortex. <laughs> and and so my background started in Chicago. SPX for market maker, as you can see in the picture, I did that for 10 years. So I ran an index trading group down there. I then transitioned to the Wall Street trading desks. I started with the Credit Suisse back in the early days of 2002. Uh, I then, you know, had a successful career on a few different bank desks. The, the longest, I guess, period, the most senior was with the City Group, where I ran their index volatility trading desk for, uh, for a good seven years. And uh, also worked at a few other the investment banks in New York on their volatility trading desks. So kind of been in my blood to, to trade volatility, trade options, futures, you know, light exotics, you know, different, different kinds of derivatives. Most recently I joined uh, this three years ago, I made a little transition in my life, you know, stopped staring at screens all day long and joined working with Myax on their spikes volatility index proprietary product. There's also other proprietary products we do look at and we are hopefully launching some in the near future. But as of now, I really just focused on the volatility products the spikes volatility index and obviously that's my forte my background and then kind of know it inside out no you know part of my my big value add is also knowing the the audience and the industry and having a lot of different contacts that whether it's institutional pension funds or even some of the market making firms just kind of, kind of the whole gamut so i'll, I'll stop there but you know, and also thank you for having me on today and i thank you and spot down and all your your participants the spot game of folks love to kind of dig in into the weeds, cool. so to speak. So we're hoping to hoping to do that here. So if you could tell us a little about about the Miami Exchange, I think it would be helpful. There's what eight is it? Eighteen options exchanges now. So there's six, 16? sixteen. Yes, sixteen plus. Six, sixteen <laughs> plus. 16 so officially, yeah. Right, and I think a lot of times we put an order into like our little sweeper or whatever it may be mm -hmm. on our TD Ameritrade platform, whatever it is, and we don't realize like there's a whole lot going on under the hood there. And in the Miami Exchange is, is one of the newer exchanges, right? But a lot of innovative products there. Yeah, when most people enter options order, they don't know which exchange it's going to, depending on how sophisticated you are. Some some people preference certain exchanges over others, and there's reasons for that. But yeah, a lot of times you. You know, when you give up your order, it goes through some, you know, order router that's going to, you know, monetize the best opportunity for you, look at fiduciary responsibilities and as well as whatever other features that exchange might offer. So yeah. let's, but go on, just back up a little bit. So Miami International Holdings is the only company that owns and operates these exchanges. We have three option exchanges on the Myax. We also have an equities options exchange, total equities that falls under the Myax umbrella. And then we own the uh, 2020, we bought both MGX and the Bermuda Stock Exchange, BSX, uh, MGX being the Minneapolis Green Exchange, which gave us a, a futures, you know, a CFTC futures license along with the MGX clearing. So that made us immediately able mm -hmm. to list at that time after we purchased the MGX, we listed the spikes volatility futures on the, on the exchange there. And those are actually listed on MGX, but you access them through the CME Globex platform. We have a, an arrangement with CME for that. So yeah, works out. one thing I will mention on the MyX option side, uh, across the three exchanges, I think last month, April, for April, last month numbers aren't out yet. In April, we were at 16% roughly of the, uh, the, uh, of the market share on the multi-listed options. 
And yeah, you know, so it's, as I like to tell people, a lot of them are like, no, I've never heard of you guys. But yeah, we are a big part of the overall options volume. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's kind of, it's an interesting thing to touch on because I, I had the bank experience and kind of saw under the, again, under the hood of order routing and all the exchanges. And it's something you don't think about much as a, as a end user, right? To like a retail trader, like, like I am at least, and you're putting the order and it just goes down to exchanges, but there's whole conferences set up to figure out where the best place is to put my order and how do I place that trade and what fee are the exchange tra- charging and all these different things. And so you know, that's a, that's a huge cottage industry. <laughs> under, yeah. Cottage yeah. Industry under We're that. not getting into that today, but there's a whole market structure. Yeah. There's, and, and the hard part too is with all the exchanges, we're constantly changing those formulas to right. optimize for their clients or for their whatever reason. Right. But yeah, that's it's a constantly moving target. Yeah, and particularly nowadays in the kind of the zero fee days, at least for the again the retail end user, yep. you don't think about it quite as much either. But we'll touch on that, I think, slightly in a moment. So let's move to spikes here if we can. This is a chart of spikes here that I just put up just to give everyone a little context of what the product is. And it looks a lot like the other well-known volatility index, the VIX index, in terms of what it's moving, what it's tracking. And as I put up on here, the kind of TLDR statement, so you know what we're getting into, is that it does measure 30-day volatility, but it measures it in the spider options as opposed to SPX. And then there's this idea of variant swap methodology, which you're so kindly said you'll dive into with us there. And so any any point you want to make on this slide or should we kind of pop to the next one where we have a little bit well, more? Well, I mean, the only point is if you were to superimpose the, I think we have something about this later on in the presentation, but... The- if you were to superimpose the VIX volatility index on top of this, it would be very much a lockstep, very, very close proximity to one another. I'll talk about the differences in the two a little bit later, but yeah, let's let's go to the next slide. Cool. Yeah. So, so the spikes index, we'll kind of dig into what it is, why you'd want to use it, who are the end users, and and kind of what's the advantage or what's the difference over some of those current other volatility indexes. Yeah. So, well, a little history. Spike came about by it was created, invented. By an individual out in Sydney, Australia, Simon Ho, who runs a firm called T3 Index. He is a former VIX trader, or still probably does some VIX trading. Former VIX trader, got really fed up with the you know, exchange fees and things like that. So he went back to his financial engineers at his firm and said, let's create a you know, competitor product to the VIX. Hopefully we can find some of those products on it at a lower at a lower fee product. And actually, another exchange had actually bought it at one point, and then due to a merger, that they basically released him from the obligations with that exchange. And then MyX contracted with T3 Index. And now we have we jointly licensed the products and we have futures options on the index itself. And then we also have some spike ETFs that were listed by Convexity shares. And those are two ETFs that are traded on the NYSE ARC exchange. So the big thing here is that based on spider volatility, and SPX options and Spider options are both on the S&P 500. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine they track each other very closely, mm-hmm. uh, if not identically. The What we've done with the Spikes volatility index, though, is we switched it up and we have this, what we call a price dragging mechanism. So when we're actually taking the prices into the calculation, we don't just use the mid, we actually take into account the last trade price as well. Mm. So the, there's always a price. So you never, sometimes you'll see the, uh, the competitor index VIX sometimes has a big spike up or down or uh, just, it just looks like a random, random bug or something. And that is caused because the, it's, it's on one, ex- SPX options are one exchange for the most part. Single listed. And when that, when someone widens up the bid offer spread extremely, that will cause a calculation in the VIX index to have a drastic move. So for the index itself, we've kind of fixed that problem with this price dragging methodology. The, uh, we also disseminate it every 100 milliseconds. So what I like to say, people are obviously you can't trade the index itself, uh, as this audience most likely knows. Uh, but I think what's important is if you're using like an indicator, this obviously, if you're using a volatility index for an indicator, this, the spikes volatility index will a publishes faster and also is less likely to have those big jumps or gaps right. or so something to keep in mind. Yeah. And I, those are two very important components there because the VIX is based on bid and ask, right, of all the options. And so that price dragging component should take a lot of the noise out. Yes, it can take it out. If, if, so if the market's widened up a lot, yes, it'll take it into account. Definitely. Right. right. Less, um, less price inflammation. And, it, you know, and of course, it's built off of SPY options, which trade on all 16 exchanges. So you always have, you know, there's most likely always going to be a market in one of them. You know, one of those yeah. Exchanges. 
they all decide to pull their quotes. So you'll still see, see some quotes, but if SPX widens up a lot, that's where the, the problems come in. Right. And that touches on some of the things that we're talking about under the hood. There's all these exchanges. And when you're trading the spiders, the spiders are listed on all exchanges, to be clear, and Apple's listed on all exchanges, but the SPX and the SPY are only on the SIBO exchange, that single exchange. And so some people feel like that diversification of having a product that's multiply listed and has a little bit better liquidity and, and more consistent prices. Yes. So the spikes utilizes the popular variant swap, swap variance swap, excuse me, <laughs> methodology <laughs> and uses live options to calculate volatility. Now, I don't know if you want to kind of get into variant swap methodology now, and just, you know, we wanted to kind of give a TLDR to people here because this is something that you know very well. We could talk about it here. Or do you want to talk about it a little bit when we get into the kind of the fixed strike ball and some of that other stuff? I'll put a little, I'll put a little bit of fear. I mean, just the variant swap methodology is nowadays it's, when it first came out, you couldn't find anything on it when variance mm -hmm. first started trading, but that methodology is pretty well known. This is a variation of the formula here that we use for our spikes volatility index. Yeah. And I'll just highlight one piece in here that, uh, that I think is really important for those, well, just, just a generic view of it is without getting into all the numbers and calculations. When you look at this, the way the weighting is, the way the strikes get weighted by their contribution to the calculation is one over the strike squared. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it, it it puts a little more weighting on that those downside options. Mm. Well, and it's kind of a critical point where the option prices become so low that they have less impact. But at some point, there's this critical area where the the, the formula will, will kick in those downsides at a much greater rate than you probably really want to. So anyway, right. just takes the full strip of options into 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 consideration. The typical variant swap. What we do is we truncate ours, but I'll go over to this a little bit later when we get to the details of that. You know, we have to truncate it at some point rather than doing the full entire strip. And then with that weighting, it's also kind of a unique thing. We used to call it the, the 30 delta put test. If you look at a 30 delta put, a lot of times it lines up with the uh, price of the, the variance, the mm -hmm. square root of the variance, I should say. So we always talk about variance in volatility terms, but really variance is the volatility square. So uh, yeah, so we can we can get to this more. Yeah, we, and, we and just to be clear, when you say strip of options, you're talking about all the available options on the given expiration, right? Yes, typically, yeah. You will you'll whatever's available. You so if you bring up like your old mon or options montage, that's the strip. Yeah, the strip of options. Yeah, exactly. Low strike to high strike. You would use the out of the money puts up until the at the money. And then you flip over to the at the money calls all the way to the upside, wherever you're truncating that. We truncate it similar to VIX around the, around the five cent options, just to keep it basic. When there's two consistent zero bid options is the VIX format formula. We use it when there's two consistent to midpoint five cent options. But ours are on SPY, VIX uses it on SPX. So you can imagine that our five cent option is a lot higher of a strike than their five cent option. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. So well, we can get into that a little later. Though. I have a different slide to uh, kind of dig into that. Sounds great. Yeah. But... Oh, here, here. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. So a couple of things just real quickly. I don't want to make this whole you know whole day about about spikes and mix, but we can. I just wanted to highlight the products to your your trading community. So spikes again, based on spy options, all sixteen exchanges. We have that price strain methodology that impacts really just the index index itself. And then one thing to note is that we use the first two monthly expirations in the calculation, whereas VIX is, you know, a few of us, a couple of years back, they added monthlies and weeklies between 23 and 37 days expirations. Mm -hmm. So they, they were taking to a lot more um, data points, but in the end, that settlement the process and the, you know, you both, both products settle on the. The, uh, the upcoming monthly options 30 days out. So when right. we, you know, so we're doing that settlement, like for the, uh, you know, the June contract coming up, we're going to be using the July options that are on the, the third Friday expiry hours are on, you know, Vic Spike uses spy options and the VIX uses the SPX options to calculate that final settlement. And uh, so then we, we do not include those weekly options in the calculation. So just want to make sure that that's yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to talk, move you talking in a couple minutes about that sort of short dated volatility and how that may affect these longer dated metrics. We can yeah, yeah, uh, talk, cool, on that, yeah. talk on that one in a second. So one of the one of the items that you want to highlight here was the correlation. So when you're talking about 
you know, how to spike move or measure things in regards to the VIX or the VIX futures. You like to look at the futures metrics a little bit more than the index, right? Yeah, I, I do because the index, index itself, like you, you can't trade it. You know, as you know, you can't buy and sell spike or VIX because it's, it's just not tradable. Or mm -hmm. But you trade derivatives that are based on that index. At right, so it's these here. And the pricing of those products, the futures, is all related to S&P, SPY, or SPX auctions. But yeah, so the futures, you can see here, they move pretty much lockstep with one another. And now this is correlation. The prices can be a little bit different, which we can maybe talk about later. But so the actual price of the future can be different from one to the other, but pretty much very tight. And like I said, the correlation is, is right in line. Right. So if you're, if you're comparing the two products, then if you want to sort of take a short volatility view or whatever, betting directionally on spikes is going to be the same functionally as, as betting short or long the VIX products. Yes. Okay. So a few reasons, and I know I want to be clear again, we were looking at the variance methodology there and in this slide in particular, there's a lot of information and data in these slides. So a spot game and subscribers obviously be able to download these slides to kind of go through things a little bit more detail here, but anything from a high level you want to touch on in terms of the difference between when spikes may deviate from VIX. I also just want to say quickly too, that I think this gives a lot of insights into how these volatility products work. And so that's why I think it's really great to cover some of this stuff. Well, yeah. So, you know, the, the main things I comment on or the, like you said, everybody else should go later look out, but the, the index itself and the futures, um, you know, you'll notice sometimes they're, you know, they're different. Yep. Obviously, and I always like to start with the, uh, the, the, the last point first, you know, the futures, which is a tradable product, there can be supply and demand imbalances. There can mm -hmm. be massive buyers of VIX futures. There can be big sellers of spikes futures for whatever reason. So maybe there's a basis that, that widens between those two because of that. But from a theoretical framework, the spikes index first has the seller that's based off spy options versus VIX, which is based off SPX. So on a typical monthly expiry, the SPX options, they use the AM options for the settlement yes. population, whereas spies are settled, the spy options are PM settled options, they like fire on the clues. So there's an extra valuation between that strip of options, between those two, two different components, right? You know, from, just from a day component. Then there's also a difference where the, when there's a dividend component, when SPY goes X dividend on like this June expiry coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the May expiry happened for SPY spikes, we were using the, the June SPY option strip which had, there was early exercise value in some of those, the call strikes that are being used in like methodology calculation. So it causes a little bit more of a premium because of that. I see. And then one other main difference too, is that the truncation methodologies what I talked about before, where we truncate the strip also based on that five cent option. So for that reason, Spikes is gonna have a trader strip of options that we're using without getting into the density of it, but the actual range of strikes will be narrower for the spike settlement. And we really like that because on the downside, we've seen some, there's a, there's a term I won't use, but on the downside tail, there's always been a lot of fear of big orders coming in and just kind of moving the index one way or the other on uh -huh. the VIX. We feel on SPY's options plus our higher truncation, we feel that that's much less of a risk for, you know, kind of a, kind of deviations in that settlement price. And then, and then as far as, what the end user is going to get out of this. I believe the, the fees are generally a little bit lower for trading spikes and the spikes futures, right? Versus yeah, that's, yeah. that's the primary reason that somebody like myself would want to use yeah. one product versus the other. So, so look, it, it, it takes a long time for a new product to be, to be taken on and adopted by folks, but there's a lot of things that have to take place for people to start trading new products. But the bottom line is it was created to be a competitor, a disruptor, Bring competition to the market. You know, using all the, the sales pitches. In reality, yeah, the, the fees are much, much lower. I'll just give a quick example on the futures. We are right now. We have no exchange fees, and we're you know we're charging twenty the twenty cents for the clearing fee. Whereas the competitor VIX product futures are roughly around a dollar and a half for your end users. So that's obviously you have to check with your firm, your trading firm, to see what they're charging. But that's where there's a lot of cost savings there. Right. And then also in the options, we have a much lower price point in exchange fees and, you know, no proprietary licensing fees, things like, things like that going on. So the, yeah, so, so that plus, I'll add one more point here that people don't really think about a lot is it's it just, 
it, it gives you another point of access to the S&P 500 volatility markets. Uh, if you think about it, I'm not expecting anything, but if you think maybe somehow the other exchange or you can't access their futures or for some reason there's a, something happens where you can't access that market and you have another place to go, you're avoiding that single point of failure or that you have currently all exposure to one exchange, one product. So it's, you know, it's a diversifier. Yeah. Yeah. So think about like right now, like people are trading S&P EMAs, whatever their future system, you know, crashes, they can trade spy, spy ETFs to get their Delta. So it's, that, that's why I, I like to do it was those are the main two points. And, you know, we, we like the index player. So. Yeah. Competition breeds innovation. I mean, that, no doubt about that. So the, yeah, the, no, it's the time is right for it. Yeah. All great for us. And then there's obviously the ETF. If you want to touch on that quickly. Yeah, the ETFs, you know, the, the only thing really there is that we have a, a Spikes Short-Term Futures Index, SPKF, which is there. Uh, you can look at that index. So there's two ETFs that are there. One is, you know, one times the index and one is one and a half times the index. So those are, those both hold Spike Futures and roll on a daily basis. And the levered one has to obviously rehedge on the, you know, when moves happen in the marketplace, involves what it wants to check. So is the is the ETF then subject to that same kind of contango decay that some of the other VIX ETFs yeah. are are subject to? Yes. Yeah, but we can talk about that. You know, so and one thing just for me, I, I'm not I, I cannot speak to the ETFs, but I can speak to the index like index right. that they track. So yes, the index, you know, has that is definitely impacted by contango because you're rolling the position on a daily basis from the short contract to the next month. So one month contracts to the second month futures contracts. But when there is a contango in place, meaning the, the second you know future is higher than the first, and you're always paying more and selling less. And you're you know you so there's this constant drag on those on the index. And that's mm -hmm. in normal times the index term structures are in contango. So in general the, the index typically trends lower. And there's there's a lot of cool cool trades and stuff like you done on that and just but just knowing that knowing how the index works is very important whether you're trading these etfs or any other etf that has you know, a commodity based or, or even a spot well on there could be a commodity based futures mm -hmm. and I, I do put spikes and VIX futures in that same category they're very similar they have a turn structure so yeah Cool. Good to know. So consider that roll down effect accordingly if you're thinking of getting long or, or short the product. We are. Good to know. You got to be aware of that. And one of the things I found poking around is a lot of us look at that VIX Central site, but you have a site, it's the volatilityhub.com where you have this term structure, it offers a lot of other additional features that I think are pretty cool. So I wanted to point that out for everyone who uses, uses yeah. a, or is generally looking for data and information. Yeah, this is a partner firm, the T3 Index, that came up with this volatility hub, and it's still it's still in development phase, but it is live. You can go and access it. And the point we're talking about just now is that contango at the bottom there. Yep. I yep. know what data this is from, but you can see the spread between the front from contract the and the second contract. There's you know dollar eighty five in this example, in price terms, and you know it's a ten percent in the percent terms. So. And now what we want to do is we want to sort of slightly transition here. One of the things that we were talking about this morning was this idea that the volatility index like Spike made a one month low. And I think this probably goes back to a low to 2020, if it's anything like its counterpart, the, the VIX. But there was the scuttlebutt around particularly Fintwit was that, okay, it looks like vol went down, but in actuality, if you look at on a fixed strike basis and some other measurements, volatility actually seemed to go up. And so I was super excited to have you here to kind of walk us through these these different concepts and ideas. And then a little bit after that, you're going to talk to us about some of the things you were thinking about when you were running the various derivatives desk of how you'd handle orders and things like that. So first, let's talk about this idea. So spikes hit a one month low, and I think probably a much longer term low than that. But if we look at different measurements of volatility, again, it looked like volatility went up. So what I wanted to do was I'm going to set this up for you here. When you look at term structure in this case, we talked all about this in our subscriber notes a lot. So everyone here is familiar with this, but at the money implied volatility went down. And this is from, this is a week over week basis. You could look that on a day over day basis. And this is the white line is Friday's expiration and the red line is Thursday. And I highlighted in green, the roughly 30 days to expiration. Cause that's what these volatility products use. And as you can see, it looks like implied volatility took a drubbing on, on Friday. And again, you know, the VIX hit these new lows, et cetera. So 
what does this actually mean or what's the kind of appropriate way to look at that? And for this, I think we all understand this term structure chart looking at the money. I wanted to flip over to this slide, which shows fixed strike volatility. And this is where I'm going to hand the baton to Tom, who is the, the real all-star here in understanding how to disseminate this. Yeah. So I always like to reference one thing. When, when everybody's analyzing volatility and talking about volatility, they tend to look and think about what they see current, whether it's big spikes, ethylene, applied volatility. And, and, and that's in terms of, of percentage of the at the money. So you think about what, in the previous slide where you had 100% money this, you're looking at the at the money volatility as the market moves to a new, so the at the money is at a new strike level right? in dollar right. terms. So in percent terms, what you have here is like, if I was analyzing well, I'd be like, oh, it's a lot lower than it was a week ago. But when, once you... I was like to say, once you strike a trade or once you put a trade on in the fixed strike world, you're subject to the applied volatility of those options that you have now in the portfolio. You can no longer look at the VIX or any kind of money that's analytics to, to predict if you're going to make or lose money or, or to backtrack your, to, to look back at your PL changes. So once that happens, you have that trade on. I always liken it to this example is a great one to show from the two day change here. I had a position on once, long a lot of volatility in Vega, option Vega. And I remember the a boss of mine once came over and was like, man, you must get chill today. Cause he, he looked at the VIX index, which had rallied, market VIX had gone down, SP had rallied, but fixed strike volatility went higher. Mm. I, I actually made a lot of money that day because we were long option volatility. Forget about the gambling impact, but. But uh, yeah, so that, that it's, it's, it's an interesting one to think about. You can't look at that. So I always like to think of it as when I'm analyzing volatility, I like to look at the, the percentage where you are now. And uh, once I have a position on or I want to back test the position on, I think about fixed strike volatility because that's actually what you have in your books. Right. Now, so that is different if you're trading some exotic derivatives that do float with the after money similar to VIX options, spike options, futures, those will be impacted by that floating floating strike concept. Right. So the floating strike concept, we talk about this is when you're basically looking at volatility from a moneyness perspective, like yep. on this skew chart here, we have moneyness on the x-axis. Yes. Yep. So it'll be... Sorry, I didn't mean to flip that. And then Friday, you know, you know, Charlie, Friday was interesting because you had, you know, and you got to remember one thing too. So when, when, the, when the market, so if you just look at the, on the, on the red line here, the first, as the market rallied from that green arrow, that's where we were, 42, whatever. 4220 is where the market was on, on Thursday's yeah, close. We rallied up to that much higher strike, right? So the 4280-ish or so. 4280. That, that's kind of how... What, what's being, we call it the, the implied move. So this is what would be the implied move in kind of a, you know, there's a little bit more of the math that goes into it, but we would, we would imply that that would be the vol change in a spike type index. In it's most basic form or VIX index, the, at the way ball is going to move down. Yeah. So this on the, I look back on the 31st of May, if you can, can you go down that one slide again with the skew metrics on this one? Yeah. So this is really interesting. So on the 31st of May, this is actually, go. this one goes to, uh, this is basically the 25 delta put, 25 delta call mm -hmm. back from, uh, you know, like uh, January 22 to June 2nd of 23. Now, what was interesting to me here is that on the 31st of May, you know, based on my calculation, I, I just did a Bloomberg, so I didn't, I didn't do fancy, but it's just, the, this is just the ratio, the, the put, 25 delta put divided by the 25 delta call. So on the 31st of May, it was at 98 percentile. It was huge and really steep. And then on, on Thursday and Friday, you could see it just completely just collapsed. Yeah. So I when the skew is so steep like that, and you have a market that's rallying pretty fast, you tend to see what's called, you know, we call it a reset with strike balls. Uh, and the reset, they all kind of bumped up higher. Basically, the market's saying, you know, at the money ball, got too cheap, too quick. And we're going to raise it up. Mm. And when I say half the money ball, I mean that 100% ball. So I think it's too too cheap now. We're going to, there's going to be demand for options. All the balls are going to move higher. Does that make sense? And then you can see now we're back on the percentile on this right hand side there, the 43 percentile. And this is, I personally like to look at 
for simple calculations of skew, I like to look at 25 delta put minus 25 delta call, and I divide it by the at the money forward volatility. Um, it kind of gives me a normalization. But in reality, I actually like to look at it in standard deviation terms, where I take a downside standard deviation put based on that maturity's volatility, and I compare it to a similar call, but also divide that by the at the money volatility. Or we can do that in another. We can get into that in another. Yeah, the, we have a we have a metric where we do that calculation of just subtracting the at the money or, or the the twenty five delta call from the put, but we don't do the normalization, which is probably yeah, yeah, you can set similar pictures, but yeah, I like to normalize it. You know, if you really think about it, it, makes it makes more sense. And a lot of times, it's like whatever's easiest. Yeah. So just to just to kind of drill this last point home here, you touched on it quickly, but the the on Thursday's close, the at the money option, the the, the S and P closed right here at forty two twenty with an applied vol of roughly. So the at the money had an applied vol of roughly twelve and a half, and then on Friday we closed at forty two eighty. And if you looked at what the forty two eighty implied vol was on Thursday night, it was eleven and a half. And so all that happened with that the VIX or the one month you know at the money vol coming down it was just we slid down. Well, kind of this this curve here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that can be shown if you look at at the money vol here, where this is 100% of the money is to your earlier point, where this goes from the numbers I just mentioned, which is 12 and a half to basically 11 and a half, right? So that at the money volatility, when you look at it from the money's perspective, it looks like vol dropped. But in fact, all that happened was we kind of slid down this curve, right? Yes, exactly. Now, the other key point here on the fixed strike term, though, is this white line is Friday. And so the 4280 implied vol actually did go up on a fixed strike basis. Vol did go up here, right? And you can see on the upside there, the calls actually outperformed even greater than on a, yes. you know, on a, on a relative basis, the at the money. And that's why in my skew graph, why most of the skew effect is on the upside, or flattening of the skew. The way I measure it, 25 mm -hmm. delta here, was from the upside. If I, if, you, if I could pull this up right now, I can't do a live, but 25 delta call versus the at the money call you would really see all this change happening on the call wing yeah. the put wing. i had actually plotted what i think that is here this is something i was actually running separately this morning so the fact that you brought it up yeah. uh, and i haven't fact checked this particular slide or some code i was writing so everybody take this one with a grain of salt but this spike here so basically what we're saying is what did the 25 delta call iv look like versus the 50 and it looks like along with record s p index volume on friday this kind of made it look like those out of the money Call implied ball popped quite a bit. Yeah, turtles. Got to use my test code, so that's always good. Okay, so I hope that frames the idea of what happened in the fixed strike vol world versus kind of when you're looking at some of those indicators. The sort of last point in this fixed strike time, one of the things that you had said before, and I just want to hammer this home because I thought it was so interesting, is that when you were looking to set up a trade or get into a trade, you would look at sort of, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, but kind of the moneyness, and you kind of look at these more kind of basic higher levels measurements of volatility but what you said and you touched on it again i just want to hammer home it's like once you have the trade on your risk is in fixed terms right so fixed strike yep fixed, fixed strike, strike vol terms right? Right. Vol, the fixed strike yes right and i thought that was so insightful because it's hard meant you know mentally to sort of shift between that but it makes sense like i yeah. bought the i bought whatever the 3900 put like that's what i own now i'm subject to that vol not what you know the vix or whatever maybe don't well, think about it too. If you're like, let's say you're doing a back test of a trade and you're using a hundred percent. Right, right. You, you can't because it's not the right. It's once you do that trade, it's a different structure you have on. So unless yeah. You, unless you're trading in that percentage world. Right. But normally most of us are trading in the fixed strike world. Right. That, that's, that's such a great insight and, and one of my kind of favorite takeaways so far. And then you wanted to kind of touch on this idea what we did here is we plotted fixed strike vol and and i had a bloomberg sort of i can't figure out why it's not plotting all the strikes so i apologize here some kind of funky setting but in red here is the december fixed strike vol and this is versus june in white what's interesting here is if you and i again this will be our next webinar if you normalize this into a standard deviation space you will see a very similar skew mm -hmm. very similar shapes with your with within strike spaces you have it here but my point I wanted to bring up here is that if you're looking at any of the term structure, if you could highlight your mouse over like the, I guess the lowest white, well, yeah, right there. So let's say the market moved from, let's say we're at 4,200 today yep. and the market rallies to, you know, 4,290. You can see that ball spread widening between that longer data to the shorter data. Right. And that's something you see in the term structure from your first graph whether it's, you know, fixed strike or moneyness, 
But what, what I wanted to highlight there was just that you, you're looking at the spikes, mix, future storm structure. A lot of that, when the S&P market rallies, spies, SPX, a lot of that impact on those futures is just from moving along the curve of the new FMLE at the, at the lower higher strike, lower balls, or vice versa. So yeah, I just want to highlight that there. It's, that, was, that was the main point of that. Eric here says, what do you mean specifically by normalizing the volatility? So I think when we're talking about skew, I like to normalize it. When I said that when I take the 25 delta put minus 20 delta delta mm -hmm. call, when I say I normalize it by at the money vol, this graph is not going that way, but I, I divide it by the at the money vol. And the at the money vol is different each day. And those 25 delta puts and calls are different each day. But when you do that, it helps to normalize that 25 delta skew on a different vol levels. So it's kind of, and obviously the higher bar changes your deltas of the options. I call it the normalizing effect, but yeah, that's something. And if you want to standardize like an index, if I wanted to compare the, uh, the SPY vol versus Q vol or versus IDVM vol, that makes it much more apples makes apples. It easier to compare apples to apples. Mark asks on the educational side, what do you consider some of the top books to read or learn about volatility trading and understand the concept overall? There's some of the classics out there like Natenberg and things, but any other sort of books or resources that you can come up with off the top of your head that were particularly I like helpful? I, I've read them all in years back, but I kind of, at some point I, I had to stop because I had a, you know, a lot of other things going on. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I still have like the, you know, I call it the Natenberg book is always one of my favorites. And I always call it the layman's, the layman's approach to, to auctions trading. It's just much more intuitive. Obviously the old whole book, if you want to get more dive more into formulas and mathematics. But there's so much stuff on the internet now that you, can, you really you really can just do searches. And one thing I was like, another book and I always like too is the you know, you know probably show age a little bit too is the Options as a Strategic Investment by by McMillan because yeah. that one was more like when I took my trader hat off and I was thinking more about me as a as an investor and different impacts of you know it talked about tax consequences it talks about other little. Other unique things you don't think of as a professional trader. So I always thought that that was a, a good read. But there's so many things out there now that I, I'll just read one off. So I read research papers. I read, you know, just diff, different. You know, a lot of people are publishing white papers. Nice. Uh, there's a few different spots to go look for those. We'll have one at the top of there. But yeah, I, still like the old, I still like the old market wizards. Good little short stories. <laughs> Way back when. That is a blast from the past, the market wizards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, the the last thing. Oh, so I'm sorry. Is that again? So I'm showing my age again. But yeah, there. you you are. You're older than me. That which which happens rarely these days. One of the last things I want to touch on that you were kind of just walking us through this idea and this hits, hits touches on a lot of the things that we do here at Spot Gam is I want to kind of pretend that you know a big buy side trader called you up back on your your desk days. And in this case, we just say, let's buy a bunch of spy calls. And, and the instrument is important. I just want to talk through the mentality of what would happen when you were kind of looking at that order or you took it on and you decided, okay, I'm not wearing the risk of this position. What are some of the things you go through? Do you hedge it? Do you try to lay it off? Can you just walk us through that kind of mentality or or sort of the checklist of things that you make? Yeah, through sure, through sure. Situation? Yep, so sure. So so what, one thing you notice is that the, the trader coming to you with a trade has probably thought about it, has probably had a few minutes to ponder it, think what they want to do. When they come to you for a trade price, you are. And this is all done high touch, I'll say. I mean, there's, you know, it's not computerized, but you have, you have like 30 seconds to make a price and make a decision. I mean, so, so things that go through my head back in, back in my old, you know, my desk training days would be, first of all, liquidity of the underlier, liquidity of, liquidity of the dairy, of the, of the time of day. Sometimes we have metrics for those things. Other times it was more about just feel intuition. Is there an announcement coming out in the next minutes? Is there some kind of news coming out that I need to be aware of? I watched somebody back in, I think it was 98 when the show my age again, when, when the, the Fed cut rates and somebody in the SPX pit had sold some calls to buy futures and they went up like 50 points and he never got his futures. And I think he was out of business the next day. So it's always knowing like, you know, just, is there going to be a air pocket? Is there something going on? But that you should just know as a trader being on top of the markets all day long. And then the other thing is really like, okay, what is the risk of this trade? What is the gamma profile, the delta profile, we, the, the vega profile, the value, the vulgar, all the, all the different griefs I could throw at you. Is there any interest rates I need to hedge? But 
you know, all this data was in your in your head, and a lot of this, a lot more tools too that you can put in your model. You can see all these 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 inputs and outputs. But then it's also about like, all right, let's say it's not spy first case. Let's say it's a off the run ETF that's not as as popular. And I'm like, wow, I'm going to probably have to trade the whole other side of this thing. Mm -hmm. What am I going to, you know, let's, let's say the underlier is deep enough. I can get my hedge off. So the Delta is taken care of. But now I got this big, you know, volatility, Vega, gamma position on that I need to hedge out. So in those cases, you would look to things that are highly correlated, something that's in a similar sector or a similar, that would give me this kind of the same Greek overview. So a lot, like one example I'll even use in you know, a little more popular ETF would be like in the Dow Jones back in, there was times where I did massive trades in the Dow and the Dow futures and diamonds, and that, it just wasn't liquid enough. So right. you, know, you would hedge in S&P minis or in big futures back in the old days, but now you'd hedge with S&P minis or, or SPY Delta. And then you would go and you would trade out of that pair. You have an up and down between the Dow Jones, I did the, it would have diamonds or DJX options, or you have an up and down between those and S and P. So you, you kind of work to wind that down. But in the end, like as a desk trader at a bank, you're looking at we have things kind of we have things kind of sectorized, but you kind of roll everything up into you know from like I was always on the index desk, and we roll everything up into like an S and P type of Greek, whether it's because that was the most liquid products to go to hedge with. So even if it was a VIX, you know I didn't. Trade spikes for around when I was still trading. Uh, when I trained VIX portfolios, I would break it down. Like I have my the VIX future broken down by each Vega bucket, so I knew exactly where the risk was. You would so you would have everything kind of rolled into a portfolio, but then you had ways to like dial it down and dig deeper into the into the uh, the nuances of the positions and where they're coming from and what's what's on and and then even like as you approach expiry, we always talk about I would talk about these zero DTE options, but as you approach expiry, you really start thinking about your position by strike. You know, you get you get down to that and a little nuance. But if I had two year, or three year, or ten year positions in my portfolio, I, I cared about the regions of my Vega. I cared about the overall overall portfolio. A kind of long winded answer to your uh, your <laughs> simple question, but I, I feel like people don't care the sell side trading desks that provide liquidity. To the market, enough credit for what they're actually doing and the risk they're taking. And especially nowadays, the risk limits have gotten really tight right. for, for most well, most people, whether it's a clearing firm that's going to charge you or whether it's your internal risk department. Well, you have to you have to know also know how to cover the the risk. It may not be that exact option, but you may need to cover the you know, your downside stress scenario, which is something we always look at day in and day out. What if the market went down 10%, how much would I lose? Right now, you you factor in different correlations and betas and so all the different products, and that's that's kind of how you would manage it. Though. So long, long answer, sorry there. I'll no, start. it's it's very interesting to hear. So so you would you just and I know it's been a couple of years, but would you could you see a scenario where now rather than having to buy or sell futures if you're looking to hedge kind of intraday or whatever it may be where you would use the zero DTEs? Like, can you see? When you see that zero DT, you know, trading availability, is that something where you go like, oh, I would have been using that all day long? Or is that something where you'd be like, I can't really understand why an institution would really want to use that? Yeah, as far as the um, desk would want to use that. I mean, saying. look, look, we, we always traded zero DTs. There's just more of the doubt, right? Mm -hmm. So we always had, you know, told, we always had monthlies and quarterlies, then we had weeklies and monthlies. So worst case scenario, you, you can always look out a week and find some liquidity in a, a weekly index option to find something. And now you can find, you know, then it was the Wednesdays and now it's, now it's every day, but yeah, I would definitely be using them as part of my overall portfolio hedging and risk management. And I'm sure a lot of times our clients would trade with us and take us out of those positions or put us into something maybe we didn't really want. So you got to be fast to figure out how you want to hedge that trade out of it. The shorter dated options, they, they can be very risky, but as long as you're in the back of your mind, what your next hedge is, the you know, next trade is going to be to offset that risk. You're, you should be, you should be okay. But so yeah, it's it's a tricky one. But I would definitely be using those for for optionality. As far as delta, it depends. But mm -hmm. you know, it hasn't said before that the options market deltas are deeper than underlying equities or even some not not necessarily S and P futures, but other other products. Yeah. One other question: Did you have like a delta notional value where you go like, if I'm too fast at this, I'm really going to move the market? Sort of like this, the, a trade size in your mind where like. 
this will have impact. And I know it's different for a game, a game shop or whatever. So let's just talk about a, a general sort of broad market ETF. It's like, what, what would you classify as like a big order? Or what was like that threshold to be like, all right, this is a big order. I got to kind of manage this a little different. Yeah. It's hard. It, uh, yeah, it's a hard one to answer that. It, it really depends on the, the ticker, the time, the day, or the week, the month, yeah. the hour. <laughs> is it you know? Is my boss over my shoulder? <laughs> yeah. So really, it really, really would depend on the on the exact scenario. So uh, you know, a lot of times we would do a trade and like, all right, the whole market's expecting us to hedge right now. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not. Let's wait. Right, let's see right. something else. Let's let's go to lunch and come back, and then we're then we'll worry about it. Because <laughs> look, you know, you're you're in a position, you're in a risk taking position, and you know, you have to quantify that risk. And if you're always just being a robot and selling your calls and buying your hedge yeah. at the market, like you're probably going to you know, have negative expected value coming out of those trades. But if you might use the algo now, you might use some different kind of, you know, like if I was to buy S&P Delta, you know, let's say I had a billion dollars of Delta to buy on a trade, I might split it up across E-minis, buy cash, maybe even some NASDAQ futures, maybe some other, you can kind of widen up the liquidity access, if you will. So that's, yeah, so that's, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of those are sort of trying to disguise what you're doing and and mitigate the impact when you have that risk and you don't want to know what other people are doing, or or you don't want other people to know what you are doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a game most of us retail people don't, you know, have to worry about. And I can't help but think about your comment there about, hey, everyone's expecting this to hedge around the JP Morgan collar trade, which I'm sure you're aware of that, you know, everybody talks about, you know, ad nauseum, the whole world knows it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And, and so the games that they must play, knowing that everyone's expecting exactly you know, these things to happen. It's kind of interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. It can get, you know, it also can get, you know, it can get scary for the one that's holding the risk at that time. You're like, all right, everyone knows I have this position on now. So mm-hmm. but what I will say that too, and I, I knew I would talk about this earlier, one thing that everyone's you know, a lot of a lot of trade you see in the market on the tape, especially in the, I'll say in the SPX, are not necessarily, you know, impacting the market. So sometimes there will be people calling them jump switches or entity changes. So sometimes on the banks, so someone want to trade their, they trade out of two different entities, and sometimes they need to switch risk between entities. So they will do an account. You know, and, you know, it goes to the marketplace, but you know, it's lost in the market. And it's just really all it's meant to be is a move from one account to another. There's other trades I've seen where we used to trade a lot of OTC with clients. And then a few days later, they might call you up and say, hey, that OTC trade, I'd like to tear it up and look at the listings. Mm-hmm. It's nothing that we could ever recommend on the bank side. But if a client came to us and asked us to do that because they wanted OCC clearing in their auctions, those are, those are some trades that would hit the tape as well. So it's not, not everything you see hitting the market is actually what you think it is. <laughs> yeah. And that's a huge, that's a, that's a huge point, especially when well, we're well, sitting here and, you know, on this side of the equation, you have no access to any information, right? If you're in a hedge fund or or a bank or a broker, you just, you don't know anything about those large flows really. And yeah. so it's, it's a great point. Well, and it's true also, if you see something, you know, trading on the bid, you, you might assume it's, you know, a seller, mm-hmm. but it may be a buyer, but some bank, you know, had an accident let their customer buy it on the bid and they sold it right. to one pin. So like customers really, the end user was really a buyer. Like, you know, right. but, but it, the print it's their number one prime broker's all, client. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of little like nuances like that. But yeah, so the fun, it's a fun world. It's a fun universe. It is. Know? It is. A lot to follow, a lot of, you know, a lot to keep up on. Yeah. Well, we've hit the top of the hour here and I know you got, you got, you're a busy man. You got a lot of things going on. So I want to thank you very much for taking the time here to talk to us today, to go through the spikes volatility product and shed some light on fixed strike vol and insights on the desks and things like that. If there are any questions, I don't know if there's a preferred way that someone maybe would ask you questions, maybe you want to kind of avoid that topic, but they can go to the Miami exchange, right. And, and probably get a bunch of information there. Yeah, they have products at uh, myxglobal.com. We just, you know, you put up the website earlier. It's, you know, myxglobal.com is our website. It's new. So I had to think about it for a minute. We just, we just launched that new website a couple of weeks ago. 